with them for many years now. Destin and I have been doing this for two and a half years now. Almost three, yeah. Almost three, yeah. Um, so you see my face at a lot of these functions. Get to know me, I'm an open book. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, today we have uh, an amazing <laughs> presenter, Paul Dumont, uh, CPA with Beyond the Mock Accounting. Well, he's amazing because, you know, honestly, he's been doing this, what, three, three or four years now. He's been teaching this class and a few other classes uh, through the Small Business Development Center. Um, he's passionate about helping small businesses, which is why I think he fits right, right here very well. Uh, he can he can identify with you guys, but he also can bring these down, uh, the bookkeeping basics down to a level that I, I do think a lot of um, you know small business owners and people that are being pulled in a thousand different directions can understand. So uh, please give Paul Dumont a warm welcome. doing well and um, I hope that this will be a good productive morning for you um, I enjoy uh, these times I can see folks like yourselves that are interested in something that I've done my whole career and if I had to do it over again I'm not sure I would but I don't need to change now so but like Dustin said I really do have a passion for the small business <laughs> folks um, so I left corporate accounting uh, oh, let's see, about five years ago now, and um, I uh, started attending some workshops at the SBDC and realized in one of them where it was a group about this size when the presenter asked the group who knows the difference between a balance sheet and an income statement, and myself and two other people raised our hands, maybe everyone else was shy, I'm not really sure, but I really thought to myself, wow, that's, that's uh, if that's true, that folks don't know it's the difference between a balance sheet and income statement and, and what they're used for, I can be helpful in helping those folks. So I got more involved with, with the SBDC and um, kind of started my own business and not making any money, but that's okay, I'm enjoying it. So. <laughs> okay, here. okay, that's me. Um, just a few ground rules. Please let me know if anything that I say isn't clear. Feel free to raise your hand um, and uh, interrupt me, no problem. Uh, participate and speak loudly enough for everyone in the room to hear. And the only dumb question really is the one that's not asked, right? Because if you have the question, probably there's several others in the room that have the same question. And how about oh. why do we even have to keep accounting records, right? Um, several of you mentioned uh, using Excel or pencil and paper. Uh, what's the disadvantage really of that over a software? What I see is that um, with a software, you can, well, it'll allow you to invoice customers, it'll allow you to uh, enter bills so you can keep track of them, which you can do on Excel also. But really, more importantly, I think one of the huge advantages of a software is to uh, be able to you know, go in and say, I want a, an income statement profit and loss statement, or I want a balance sheet, okay? Those financial statements that we were talking about earlier. Um, and with Excel, unless you're really an expert, you know, and you know how to create macros and stuff like that, it'd be very, very difficult to you know, hit a button and have a, a profit and loss or an income statement uh, print out. So, anyway. Why do we keep accounting records? Enables you to manage your business the right way, not by the seat of your pants, right? So if you don't know, um, am I blocking you? Nope, you're good. Time I walk over there. No, I have a, a cheat sheet right here. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so if, you, if you're not keeping records, you don't know what your business is doing. You might know what your bank account is because it's easy to go online every day and look at that, but um, do you even know, you know, you might have some cash in the bank or not. Um, but are you making any money? What is your margin? That sort of thing. Helps you stay organized when dealing with your customers, your clients, your vendors. Uh, really makes you look like, or helps you look like you know what you're doing, right? And uh, this is a big one. Makes it easy to prepare financial statements so you can determine whether you're making money, what your margins are, et cetera, like I just mentioned. 
and makes it possible to find important information and documents quickly. So that's a time saver. For you folks that um, take a shoebox of receipts to a CPA or a tax accountant um, like April 1st or something like that, you know, that's probably costing you a lot of money, right? Because they charge by the hour, probably. And um, so it's time consuming to go through a box of receipts, obviously, and expensive for you. So um, that's the name of my business, Beyond the Box. We gotta get beyond the box of receipts. <laughs> Facilitates borrowing money. If you have uh, an emergency or you want to grow the business, something like that, and you go to Ent um, and you say, I'd like to borrow $50,000, they'll probably not just say, okay, here you go. You can have it, <laughs> you know, and you walk out the door with it. They're gonna ask for financial statements. They're gonna ask for cash flows. They're going to ask for, you know, your plans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, if you don't have a record keeping system, how in, on earth would you get that information for him? Slowly. Right. Yeah. You probably have to create a record keeping system. Um, helps you plan for large cash outlays like taxes. If you're uh, if you're an employer and you have quarterly taxes, for example, um, capital expenditures, <laughs> expansion helps avoid interest and penalties on late payments. So if you don't have a good record keeping system and know what you owe and you're paying late, you're gonna have interest and, and penalties, especially when it comes to taxes, you really want to try to avoid that, and especially with payroll taxes. Uh, makes filing your tax return easier, and like I said, less expensive. If you um, don't have any record keeping system, taxes are going to be difficult to do, right? Um, enables you to comply with legal requirements if you have any. There are certain businesses, obviously, that um, you've got to, like, who's, who mentioned being HIPAA compliant? Yeah, I mean, that's a big one. Um, so other industries or, or businesses might have other um, legal requirements that they have to uh, comply with, and it'll help with that. But lastly, maybe the reason many of us because of this little organization, have, we have to report every year to the IRS, really. So if we didn't have to do taxes, would we keep books? Maybe not. Because if it all goes into the bank and we spend it, it comes out of the bank, that would probably be our record keeping system right there. But these guys are keeping the CPAs and accountants of the world, of the country, uh, heavily employed, <laughs> and it's not getting any simpler. What you might hear in the news about the tax reform, making things simpler, and them showing you a little postcard, uh, what the 1040 will look like, forget it, it's not simpler, it's more complicated. I've been going to a lot of classes and webinars and stuff on that, and um, there's this, who's heard of the uh, qualified business income deduction that you can deduct 20% potentially, of your business income before you ever have, uh, basically you get a free 20% you don't have to pay tax on. Sounds really easy, right? It's not. It's very complicated. <clears throat> like all things IRS, it's uh, complicated. Top bookkeeping mistakes made by small businesses. <clears throat> not saving receipts for small amounts. Why is that an issue? Yeah. Right? If you're audited, um, you need to be able to provide not just credit card statements or bank statements, because if you have uh, on your credit card statement, it says Walmart, $350 or something like that, and you tell them, oh, that was a printer for my business, they don't know that, right? So you have to have the original receipts. You don't have to have the hard copy of them. They can be soft copy. Um, so if you have a scanner, I highly recommend you know, scanning and keeping on your computer, and of course, backup, backup, backup when you do that, so that if your computer's lost, um, stolen, floods, fires, hail, whatever, um, that you have the data still, okay? So, uh, where was I going with that? Uh, yeah, okay, so the original receipt, you don't have to have the hard copy receipts, but you do have to have detailed receipts. What if it's copied from a <coughs> 
coffee for? Well, at a networking thing. That's okay. I mean, your receipt will say that it was okay, bought. So you still should have a receipt even if it's $3. Yeah. Well, it depends on how many $3 receipts you have. Okay. You know, so if you, if you have networking expense, for example, that you report of, let's say, you know, $4,000, that may be high in your type of business. Okay. So um, they may ask about that. So audits can be line item audits. If there's something that appears to be out of the norm for your type of business, they may, may ask about that. Or it may be a full audit, maybe a random. Um, you know, there's several different types of audits. But uh, when it comes to, um, the, everything goes in the computer. And so when, you know, your type of business starts setting red flags off, because your numbers are way out of whack compared to all these other businesses like yours, that's when I notice that audits happen. So. I don't want to get mm -hmm. everyone distracted, but what about exp travel expenses that are reimbursed by a client? Once they're reimbursed, am I still required to hold on to all those receipts? That's a really, really good question. Um, yes, I would say so because you're still claiming that as an expense, right? You're claiming it as an income to offset the expense? <clears throat> or no, you're not, it's not we going on here. It as an expense because okay. it was fully reimbursed. So really what you need to keep receipts for are any expenses or, well, I guess, income too, um, that you are reporting on your tax return. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so if it's not touching your tax return, then I would say no. Okay. Mixing business and personal expenses. If we have a limited liability company in LLC, why? Why do we have it to begin with? To limit our liability, right? And other reasons like having to provide your social security number or an EIN if you are uh, helping or working for people where you're providing service and you provide over $600 worth of service in the year and they have to issue a 1099. You don't necessarily want your social security number out there floating around, right? So we maybe create a LLC so that we can get an EIN. But anyway, the um, the issue of personal and business expenses, if you're audited and everything's mixed together, and you're audited maybe for three years, you know, um, how are you going to separate that out? And how are you, you know, are you keeping receipts for both? And it would just make it very, very complicated and they frown upon that. So if you don't have a business bank account, I would get one. CDL account. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Not properly classifying employees. And it says C handout, and I guess in the back there, or in the front, um, there is a, on this first sheet here, how to classify a worker, employee, or independent contractor. What am I talking about? <clears throat> Anybody? Anybody? Whether they get a business in the way you want to pay for the um, employee in the sense that are you doing their um, insurance, are you paying taxes on payroll, or are you just saying, you come work for me and I'll just pay you, you know, not for the, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You don't pay Right, like but why? But why is it a why? Why is it even on this slide? Taxes versus no taxes. Um, it basically it classifies them whether they get a W two or a ten ninety nine. Right, and why is that an issue? Because who to who? Yeah. yeah. So what do businesses prefer? And what does the IRS and the government prefer? W two. So we have a conflict there, huh? And guess what? They're scrutinizing this more and more. And if they come in and find that you have people working for you and you are providing their equipment, you've trained them, you're telling them when they need to be there, when they can leave kind of thing, eight to five. It doesn't even matter if it's just two hours a week. We have part-time employees, right? So they can be considered a part-time employee. Um, the businesses love to have independent contractors because it's easy. You pay them, they invoice you, 
you pay them at the end of the year, you give them a 1099, everyone's going on their merry way, right? Employee, when you have an employee, even one employee, who has employees here in the business? Okay, it's a lot of work. Exponentially increases the amount of work that you have to do because you've got federal taxes, state taxes, unemployment, workers' comp, et cetera, et cetera. And um, depending on how much those things are, um, dictates how often you have to pay, how often you have to report, when you report late or pay late, you're fined, et cetera, et cetera. It's a pain in the butt, <laughs> to put it nicely. Um, so people like to have independent contractors because if they need help, hey, come on in, I'll help, you know, you can help me, I'll pay you and I'll give you a 1099 at the end of the year and we're done. Um, so that sheet that I uh, mentioned really lists a whole ton of things there that there's not one thing that if you are, you know, on this part of it, you're an independent contractor for sure, or you're this part of it, you're an employee for sure. You have to take these in um, consideration and kind of weigh them out, okay? Because I've had, um, I know of a, a, a business that had uh, people that were very part-time, where they paid them probably like, couple hundred bucks to lead an art project for school and it was determined they were employees so I'm on one side of the scale so if you hire me to do your bookkeeping or do your taxes am I your employee or am I your uh, contractor well for me if I'm doing it when I want to at my location or look at it this way if I have someone else do your taxes, you don't really care, my assistant or whatever, which I don't have one, but if I did, did them, right? You don't care as long as they're done correctly and timely. But if you have someone that you would care if they send their sister or cousin or whomever in their place, if, if they can't, think of it that way, if they cannot send someone else in their place, really leaning towards employee, okay? <clears throat> I don't wanna like beat this to death, but it's really pretty important. So do we need, to, if we have a CBA, do we need to put them as an independent contractor and issue a 1099 then? Um, do they, for your business, do they provide over $600 worth of service? Do you pay them over $600? Not yet. That's the break point. That's the yeah. break point okay. today. That's, yeah. that's filing taxes. That's less than filing taxes once. Right. Right. So if but see, individuals don't issue 1099s. So only businesses issue 1099s to other individuals or businesses. So like if you're having your personal taxes done, that doesn't count. If the business is paying for it though, and it's a business expense that you're claiming on your business tax return, yes. You have to issue 1099. You, you even have to issue 1099s to your landlords for your business. <clears throat> if you look at a 1099 miscellaneous, the first box in there, I think, is rents. Most people don't know that. But don't you only issue them if, if they make $600 or more a year? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Did I not say that? Yeah, yeah. you did. Okay. But why is that different than some other service you would purchase? You know, I mean, it's a service they're providing you. They're not really your employee. Right. They're an I mean, they're a contractor. Okay. So why do why do they why did they create the whole 1099 thing to keep us honest? If you guys are all paying me uh, to do your accounting or taxes or whatever, I don't have to necessarily report it if you don't. Right. It can be under the table, whatever. So we don't do that, obviously. Um, but. <clears throat> It, it is a way to try to discover under the table income for those people providing services um, that don't report. So because when you send me a 1099, you send it to the IRS also. So they'll match 1099s that were under my EIN, employee identification number, to my tax return. Um, I, I guess I'm still not appreciating why that just isn't an expense, a service that you buy from the accountant, 
he's not really your employee. Right, right. 1099, but I, I don't understand. So we have to issue a 1099 for accountants if we pay more than $600 a year for whatever he provides for us? Any service provider. If you have a lawn care guy. Okay, okay. one caveat to this though. If they're incorporated, no. You don't issue them to people who are businesses that are uh, corporations, right. unless they're attorneys. <laughs> There's always <laughs> no. That's not incorporated. LLC stands for Limited Liability Company, not Limited Liability Corporation. So, I'm an LLC, and if I do work for your business, um, and it costs you over six hundred dollars for a year, you need to issue me a 1099. Your uh, lawn care guy, uh, your attorneys, even if they're incorporated, you give them a 1099. Uh, because they're most, most dishonest. Well, no, I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> just verify, all attorneys who have a 1099. Even if they're incorporated, yeah. If it's over $600 a year, you paid them. Two things, S Corp then is incorporated. Yeah. They just shift it from LLC to an S Corp, or is that not? S Corp is, uh, yeah, um, considered a corporation. So <coughs> if I'm an S Corp, you don't need to issue me a 1099. Okay. But what if you're an LLC or, that files as an S Corp? Right. <laughs> That's the same thing because there are no S Corps. There's only, there's only being treated as a corporation passing through to the owners. And it's called, it's under subchapter S, and that's why it's called S Corp. But there aren't any S Corps per se. You're only taxed as a corporation that passes through you. You mentioned we also have to issue a 1099 to your landlord? For yes. For your office rent? Yes, for your office rent. Yeah, most people don't know that. So, if you have a CPA helping you with your taxes, they should be telling you that. If not, you didn't need a CPA. <laughs> But if I'm just a person, not a business. Correct. And I have more than six hundred dollars of lawn care, I don't. No, 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 no. So okay. yeah, it, individuals do not issue 1099s only businesses. So okay. if it's a business expense and it's going on your business tax return, whether that's a Schedule C or a separate return entirely from your 1040, yes. Any service providers that you pay over six hundred dollars, unless they're incorporated, that's today. Who knows what's going to be tomorrow? But so my husband is a consultant, so we get ten ninety nines. He's considered a contractor. Yes. With other people. Yes. What if they don't generate ten ninety? There's yeah. so many clients that we don't get ten ninety nines from. So do we just report the income as we know it, and yes. it's their problem? Yes. Or are we going to get pulled into no. trouble because no. they haven't? They will be in trouble. And then if they issue one and there's a discrepancy between what we know and what they have reported, then we go back to them and try and figure it out and get it. Okay, great. Typically, your income is gonna be more than what your 1099s add up to because people don't issue them right. or yeah, whatever. But So I believe, I'm not a IRS agent, but I believe what they look at is the income reported by you should be at least what the 1099s add up to, if not more. And typically, there, it's gonna be more. And what if they include those travel expenses that were reimbursed that we don't count as income? Mm, then they we should just report our income and just ignore that they've made it more and Well, well the if they're reporting it as income, you should, I mean, as um, 1099 income, you probably need to match that, and you can report it as income, but then, then you report expenses. it as expense, so at the end of the day, you're net zero, right? So it doesn't really matter that much that you're doing it that way. That's what I would do. Okay. Because you don't want, if someone's reimbursed you a million dollars, for example, and you don't claim it, uh, but they report it on a 1099, that's gonna stand out. I mean, that's a you know, off the wall example, but got it. Thanks. Question, so I keep some of my other hat I wear is I keep businesses business efficiencies, and I've been doing it for five years for a company. I get a 1099, yep. but why am I not considered an employee then? Because sometimes I do my own material, some, you know, like this restroom is your material, sometimes um, I use their material, so where do I fall? Look at that list, and if you, if it looks like you're falling more on the 
uh, employee side, maybe you are an employee. And they can be in trouble for claiming you as an independent contractor. They call me an outside contractor. Is that what you think? A lot, no. <laughs> it's not different. A lot of yeah. businesses, like we said, like to have the independent contractor. It's much, much easier than having employees. But they're cracking on it. If the government's getting their 15.3% and the end of the day, why would they care if you're a W-2 or a 1099? Um, because I think you said Because we're not, we as citizens aren't able to protect our own selves, so they have to step in and protect <laughs> us. And, Isn't that sweet? <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so that's one reason. Um, at the end of the day, if you are reporting everything um, and paying the tax on it and stuff, yeah, they're they're okay, but they need to protect us because we're not smart enough to protect ourselves. So, and it, a lot. I mean, think of the why, how did unions even start and why? You know, um, along those lines. You know, the government has been to the people. So if you're an employee and you have medical insurance, and you have a 401k, and they're paying social security in for you, and you know all these things, aren't you better off than trying to do those things yourself and probably not doing it, right? So that's my theory on it. Maybe someone else has a different theory, but. If I am given $500 for a service, I should report that as income on my IRS report, but there's no need for paperwork because it's under 600. Correct. Mm -hmm. okay. Unless you're an attorney. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Attorneys are different ball of wax, so. Uh, I, I think there is maybe back there. Yeah, if, because they're underage, they're minors, they necessarily can't own a business. But if they work for me, then they become my employee yes. of that business, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Even though it's a and family And if they're family entity. members, there are certain <coughs> privileges and different rules that you don't necessarily have to pay unemployment on them. And, you know, okay. there's certain things like that that um, it's a little bit more advantageous for you when you're hiring your, your children. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So anybody else? There was... Cool. Um, where were we? <laughs> <laughs> Lack of communication with the bookkeeper. That's another problem. How could they record something that they don't know about? You know, <laughs> you go and buy a, a vehicle or whatever uh, for your business, and it doesn't, for some reason, run through the business bank account or whatever, so they don't know about it. And you, you know, oh yeah, you know, after your taxes are done, I forgot to tell you about that truck. You know. So um, that's a problem that small businesses have is proper communication with the folks who are recording the information for them. Not timely reconciling the books with the bank statement every month. So like I said, I highly recommend you have a business bank account, business debit card, business credit card if you need it. And if you run everything through those for your business and you reconcile <coughs> your books to those statements, can't you be assured that you have pretty much everything? Now there are certain things that won't go through the bank statement or the credit card statement, like mileage that maybe you wanna claim, you know, things like that, but the majority of your business expenses and income, if you run them all through these accounts and you reconcile the accounts, you can be pretty assured that you, you're pretty good, your books are pretty good, right? So. Um, inadequate data backup, and I mentioned earlier backup, backup, backup. I really highly recommend on your computer, you have an external hard drive, or you should have an external hard drive because computers crash. Computers get coffee spilled on them. You know, things happen to the computers. Uh, fire, flood, theft, whatever. Uh, external hard drive will give you a quick way to get your information back onto a new computer or whatever. But if the external hard drive is sitting right next to the computer at your office or home, and there's one of those catastrophes, you've lost both of them. So then what are you gonna do? So 
third thing I recommend is cloud backup. You know, there's some good services out there. I use Backblaze, if anyone's heard of that. It's $50 a year, it's unlimited, and um, it backs up every day consistently, only the stuff that changed. So it doesn't go through and back up everything every day. Backblaze. Backblaze, yep. <clears throat> Not deducting sales tax when reporting sales. What do I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so, our, I don't know what it is in Miami, Mitt, but Colorado Springs 8.25 is our tax rate. So if someone comes in and buys something from you for, for $100, what do they pay you? And, and it's sales taxable. 108.25. So what are your sales? $100 or $108.25? $100. $100. A lot of small businesses, that's a problem they have. They have reported their sales at $108.25, which isn't true. You don't want to pay tax on tax that you collected. It's like you can deduct the tax, like in those coffee expenses for business meetings and stuff? The you tax that you pay? Yeah. Yeah. You can deduct the tax. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you don't want to claim the tax as income because it's not. Um, misclassifying expenses, payroll net versus gross. What, what do I mean by that? <clears throat> so if you pay someone, if their salary for a week is $1,000, but they really, after tax, get only $700, what's the expense to you as a business? $1,000. $1,000, not $700, even if it was $700 that came out of your bank account. So that's another area where we have to be careful. The, Writing off major purchases. Did you, the, what's our question? the withholding is still a payroll expense. The withholding from their check is not an expense. Well, yes, basically, because the thousand dollars is what the expense is. The three hundred that you had to withhold from them. But is if, a, if one hundred was payroll taxes and two hundred was withholding, you want to include that two hundred. If their net was seven hundred. Yeah. But 200 of that was withholding? That's still one of your expenses, right? Correct, because you claim $1,000 as, as total salary expense. Okay. It just doesn't all go to them. Right. Some goes to the government. Okay. Yeah. And then you have the employer share of federal, or I mean the uh, Social Security and Medicare, unemployment, all the taxes that only the employer pay, pays. That's also expense. So that $1,000 per week becomes Thirteen hundred dollars or something per week for the employer, mm -hmm. and the employee only gets seven hundred. So the government gets their share. Uh, writing off major purchases as immediate expenses. Now this is changing a lot with the tax report. What I'm meaning by this is when you go and buy that vehicle that you didn't tell your accountant about, um, it's fifty thousand dollars. It's typically not been a fifty dollar. $50,000 expense that year that you buy it. Typically, you would have had to depreciate it over the life of a vehicle is like five years or something like that. Did I hear someone say five years? Yeah. yeah. So, but now things with depreciation are totally changing. And is, is, unless you're like a big, huge business, you're going to be able to write everything off the year of purchase. Mm. Yeah. You have to. Do you have to? Um, I don't think you have to, actually. And what's a major purchase? Like if you buy a laptop for $2,500, is that a major purchase? It depends on, um, it depends on the size of the business. Some, the big businesses like you know Microsoft and whatever, yeah. uh, to them, they may expense everything under $100,000. To us, well, me anyway, that's a huge expense, you know? So that, so most small businesses, I would say computers and stuff, unless they're over 1500 whatever, $200,000, probably you just expense them. Um, and really, it's for tax purposes anyway. We get back to the whole reason why we're keeping records is for taxes. So we do what they allow us to do, and they're going to allow us to do more of expensing in the year of purchase than they have in the so if you're in the middle of that amortization of Good question. So her question is, she bought a vehicle three years ago. Yes. 
and she's depreciated two years of it. And now this rule changes that had she bought the vehicle today, she could expense the whole thing right away. Is, does she have to keep depreciating it one fifth a year for five years, or can she take in this year? The rest of it. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's a great question. I've thought of that myself and I haven't looked it up yet, but it's a good question. And I don't know. And maybe we can actually talk later about what I actually bought. Then. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Nice story. Cool. Um, trying to keep books without adequate knowledge of accounting and taxes. Um, that's why we're here. <laughs> exactly. That's why you're here. So now let's get into the meat of it a bit. Um, there are two methods of booking. Yes, sir. Can I ask one question before you move on? Uh -huh. You talked about the receipts. How how far back do you need to keep receipts? Um, I would say a minimum of three years because that's typically how far they can go back for an audit. But it, it is from the time you need to file. So, for example, you're going to file your 18 taxes in April of 19. Three years after that date for the 18 stuff is what you need to keep. Because they always look at from the three years from when you filed or required to file, not from the end of the year. We were aware of situations where they've gone back as far as <coughs> purchased it 10, 15, 20 years back. What was it? Something major? Uh, purchases, equipment, um, office uh, facilities, those kinds of things. And when it comes to that, it gets really, really, really bad. Yeah, when it's it comes to it major up. purchases, real estate, for example, I would keep that documentation for in my permanent files. And it doesn't have to be, you know, the documentation like this that you get that has everything in it, but at least like the HUD statement and, you know, the... Because all your taxes, everything that you file, you have to keep. Because the IRS does not keep anything beyond 10 years, they destroy it. So either they, they come in, they can even audit you, ask you for your taxes, and they don't even have it. So um, typically, how far back did they go? 14 years. Uh, do you know why? Just because they can. <laughs> that's, well, that's if they the suspect fraud, they can go back to the beginning of time. No, not that, that would. not any sense of fraud at all. Yeah, so I don't. That's just because, you know, we're told that the agent wanted to do that. Hmm. Yeah, I don't and know. And that's when you get legal counsel. Yeah, if you're ever audited, don't it do it really alone. Expensive. Don't do it alone. Yeah. Don't do it alone. Don't do it alone. <laughs> get help. Even if it costs you money, which it will, get help. Because I have noticed they respect <clears throat> the little CPA after my name more than they respect you guys. It's just the way it is, sorry. Um, and typically, we probably know more than those auditors that are auditing you. So, um, yeah, get help. If Okay, so there's two methods of bookkeeping. Cash, what's the other one? Accrual. Accrual. So under cash, income is recorded when the cash is actually received. When it goes into your pocket, when it goes into your bank account. Accrual, income is recorded when the service is provided, or the good is shipped, the order is placed, whatever your, you know, <coughs> standard operating procedures are. Basically, when you invoice, if you're using QuickBooks, for example, or another software, and you invoice a customer or a client, that is creating income in your books. So what if, yeah, I'll get there in a minute. Um, on the expense side, cash, expenses recorded. When I say recorded, I mean it's in your books, okay? When it's paid. Under accrual, when you receive the bill, when you receive the good or service, and you enter it into your books, and it's a, an expense, that is accrual. So basically, under accrual, you're going to have potentially accounts receivable and accounts payable. For money that's owed you, hasn't been paid yet, or money that you owe that you haven't paid yet. Under cash, method, can you have 
accounts payable and accounts receivable? No, because when you are on accrual and you invoice someone, what happens in your books? What happens is QuickBooks, if you're using, or any software, knows what to do behind the scenes and will record the income, double, keep, double entry bookkeeping, which is what we all have to do, well, I mean what the software does, um, <clears throat> will record income, what's the other side of it? You haven't got the cash yet. The other side of it is accounts receivable, so that you can then run a report and show your customers that owe you, you know, that kind of thing. So with cash, if we're recording our income when we receive it, what, and we're not invoicing customers or whatever, what is the entry that happens behind the scenes? When we go into QuickBooks and say make a deposit, Income. Yeah, so that the, the, there's debits and credits and we're gonna get there. The credit is income, the debit has to be something. Every Everything you do, there's a debit and a credit, right? So the debit in the case of cash is cash. And when I say cash, I mean bank account, whatever. It's not necessarily greenbacks. The debit, when it comes to the accrual and you're invoicing someone, is accounts receivable. Okay? I think you'll, you'll, anyone confused? Anyone's head spinning off? Yeah? <laughs> if there's confusion, um, I think we'll, we'll get it clarified, but if not, stop me and we'll, we'll go back. I think this is a simple question. Um, so are you saying, for my business, I choose one or the other. I don't use both. Okay. So for your books, you can do whatever you want. They don't really care. For your tax return, and we're going to get there, you have to tell them. Tell who? The IRS. Okay. Who do we tell? Our taxes to. Our psychiatrist. No. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe we cry to them. But, um, yeah, on your tax return, you'll see that. You have to tell them for your business. Now, personal, it doesn't matter, you know. But for your business, you have to tell them whether you're reporting cash or accrual. So you have to know those things. And once you make a decision, you have to stick with it. Because you can imagine, if we could flip back and forth, some years it would be better to be cash. Some years it would be better to be accrual. To what? pay the least amount that we can pay in taxes, right? Mm -hmm. Who wants to pay more taxes? Anybody? Mm -hmm. No, I didn't think so. So we would flip back and forth, whatever was most advantageous, that's why we can't. Once we make a decision the first year of your business and you file a tax return, you decide whether you're cash or accrual and then you'd have to stick with it. Unless you get a special ruling from them, which I've never done, I don't know how you would do it and how easy it's to do it, but so you have to stick with the first year that you choose, cash or accrual. I think that's Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, so, go ahead. When you gave the example of the car earlier, yes. and that was switching to accrual from cash, wasn't it? She was taking her car expenses, like the mileage and so forth, and then you jumped to depreciation. That's yeah. accrual, right? Well, so the IRS required it, right? It's kind of sort of related, but not technically, because um, depreciation is a special thing where you're just not allowed to expense the full, it, it is kind of sort of an accrual thing, yeah. But when it comes to cash and accrual, we're usually referring more to our operating income and our operating expenses. Um, a vehicle purchase, equipment purchase, or whatever, it, those big things are not typically day-to-day -day operating expenses, if that makes sense. So we, when we're talking cash or accrual, it's more of the not, the, not the big equipment purchases. Kind of don't think about it in those terms. What if you have um, a credit card? Can it still, your business still be run as cash? Okay. Yeah, so if you have a credit card 
And okay, let, what's the important date for all of us? December 31, right? Because that's the end of the year, usually. Does anyone have a different fiscal year end than the calendar year end? So December 31 is the day. So everything before that is reported in this year. Um, so you get a credit card statement <coughs> on December 25th. Merry Christmas. Um, and you are cash. The expenses on that credit card statement, are those gonna be in 18 or are those gonna be in 19 if you're cash? 19. 19, because you're gonna pay it in 19. If you're accrual, however, you'll wanna make sure that they're in 18 because that's when you technically owed it. You didn't pay it yet, there was no cash out the door, but you owed it. So accrual is you're recording things in your books and thus go to your tax return um, when they're incurred, when you owe them, when you're able to receive them for the, on the income side, et cetera. On the cash, it's pretty simple. A lot of small businesses will go cash just because it's easier to to follow, to understand. Um, in QuickBooks, for example, you choose whether your reports are run in cash or accrual. And I'll show you that. What's the advantage of accrual? Does it depend on your business size? Or? Well, if you're a big business, you have to. That's the rule. That's the law. I mean, you have to do accrual. Small businesses, they don't care. Could you touch on if you own a house and you rent it, and then you're depreciating it every year, and then you sell it. You have to re the government capture the depreciation. Uh huh. That's why I have a big tax bill right now. Um. Yeah. So, what do you want me to cover on that? Why do they do that to people, <laughs> the American person who's trying to build an estate for themselves or their family? Uh, um. A rental house? Yeah. yeah. There's something called a 1031 exchange. Yeah, if you, but if you, you just sell it outright, you have to pay the depreciation back. And I had a property that I had for 20 years, and I sold. I mean, it was nice to have that depreciation on the my tax return all those years. It was a non-cash, no cash out of my pocket for that. But then, you know, I'm like, you gave me 20 years of benefit. How about you let me pay it back over 20 years? Uh-uh, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, pay it back that year. <laughs> so let's go over, our, is it cash or accrual? You record your sales income when the job is done. Cash, cash. Mm -hmm. Oh no, when you get the money. Oh. When the job is done, yeah, they haven't paid you yet. So that's accrual. You record the utility expense when you write the check. Cash. Cash, it's cash out the door. You record your payroll expense at the end of the pay period. Accrual. Accrual. Why? Go back to cash. There's no cash out the door, so it can't be cash, right? That's a simple way to think of it. Um, you record income from a client when you meet with them. Accrual. Why? You don't got the cash yet. You record a receipt of a customer payment to sales. Cash. 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 Why? Record receipt of customer payment. It means cash in the door. Mm -hmm. um, next one. You record the payment to the bank as expense. Cash. Mm -hmm. Why? Cash out the door. Number four. Yeah? You record income when from a client when you meet with them. Yeah. So, but it doesn't mean they gave you cash? Is that why? Does not know? mean they gave you cash. There was cash. no cash exchange. You just met with them, you're gonna invoice them, they're gonna have 30 days to pay you, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, when you were talking about the credit card um, payment, why didn't you mention the date of the purchase? Because you're technically liable for that on the date of purchase. Right. So it's not your credit card statement That's date correct. with your accrual, it's the date of each purchase. That's purchase. correct. Well, yeah. So technically, if your accrual 
and you made some purchases in December <coughs> that you didn't get on the December credit card statement because your cutoff is the middle of the month and it's gonna be on your January 15th statement, technically then, yes, those expenses, if you're on accrual, are in 18, not 19. But for us, the small business people, uh, if we do well enough to even get our credit card statement in our books or not, um, that's saying a lot. So to, you know, the fine hairs of, you know, technically, yes, you're correct. And the big guys are required to write down to the penny of what they owed at the end of the year, if their accrual should be on their books and thus tax returns for that year. We have another question. Power from the table is a nonprofit, so we rely on donations and grants. At the end of the year, December 31st, people give to tip write it off on their taxes. Yeah. If we get a check in January, but it's dated December 31st, what do we record it as? Do we record it as December 31st if we receive it in January of 2019? I worked for a nonprofit for 11 years. I was the controller and if it was dated and postmarked in December, we then put it on their, let's talk 18, 19, their 18 uh, contribution statement. If it was dated in December, postmarked in January, they didn't have it in the mail by the end of December, it went on 19. Well, what about for your books? Because you haven't received the money as cash into your account until so, January. Right, so it would depend on if we're mm -hmm. cash or accrual. Nonprofits, they have special rules when it comes to taxes, like they don't pay them. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, so um, you have to do a 990 probably, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, yeah. So the cash accrual thing is not as big a deal as a nonprofit. Um, example of how to determine which basis, cash or accrual, reports in QuickBooks are run and how to change it. Okay, so this I think is the um, 17 version of QuickBooks, the 18 version is slightly different, but see over there, I, run, I ran this for my business, profit and loss, for 17, and right there under the, uh, at 6.09 a.m., I ran this, uh, it says accrual. Right there on the reports, it'll tell you cash or accrual. And this is how I can change it. I would go into, uh, into the report, you go up to the top where it says customize, and then you can choose accrual or cash. So if you're cash, and you're not doing your own taxes, and you're, you need to give your reports to your tax accountant, make sure you give them to them in cash on a cash basis hopefully they're looking at that and if you're cash and you give them reports in accrual they're going to go uh could you rerun these for me because you know the, and i'll show you an example of the kind of difference that it can make um right here how to determine what accounting method you have used in the past or how to state what method you will use for your first tax return in the business. This is an example of a single member LLC or a sole proprietor. So it's a Schedule C of the 1040, and right here, the very, almost the top, after you tell them your name and address and stuff, right here, accounting method. How many of you guys knew that was there? Okay, great, now you do. <laughs> um, this point you may be asking why do I even care this is just accounting mumbo jumbo right who cares well, here's a great example let's take a real life example construction business started in 2016 it often takes 30 to 60 night or 30 to 60 days or longer to be paid for a job and they are a multi-member LLC Let's look at the profit and loss for cash versus accrual. So that is their cash.
cash basis <coughs> profit and loss, and it's showing what? A loss, loss. of 49,000. I'm dying of thirst. Here is the same exact period, 2017, and this is on accrual, and it's $119,000. Wow, that's huge, isn't it? That's a big difference. That's why it's important. Sometimes it can be. And why is that? Okay, so that's the cash. Here's the accrual. What would cause that? Well, we're kind of getting deep into accounting, but the difference of 50,000. Let's see if the balance sheet holds the answer. And guess what? It will. <laughs> because accounting, you're debiting and crediting something. If it's not on the income statement, it's on the balance sheet. And we're going to talk about the difference between income statement and balance sheet. Does anyone need a break? We're yeah. Okay. You want to take a break? Okay. I always forget about them because I'm like, um, two and a half minutes. No. <laughs> Ten seconds, Dustin will give us. No. Ten minutes, whatever you guys need. Is there any way we could get emails of all, everybody here? Because some of these businesses could help our organization. Um, or should I just meet them individually? I would eat, I would meet them individually because usually with um, email mass emails. Um, it's a privacy thing, and we're not actually allowed to give them out. So Will you email us on different workshops that are happening up here? Yeah, we can if that's what, something that you're interested in. Um, if not, they're always on Facebook. They're always on our website. Um, Dustin and I are meeting tonight to work on 2019. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Because you're owed twenty thousand at the end of the year, are you going to pay tax on a hundred or on eighty? A hundred. But remember, you're filing your tax return in April, probably, right? So hopefully by April you have received that additional twenty, so you're going to be good to pay the tax on the hundred. How? At what point is it considered a loss? That you can, at what point? That twenty thousand dollars that person is not paying you, you've already paid taxes on twenty thousand dollars that you haven't gotten. At what point is it a loss and you can? So if you if you have a hundred thousand in eighteen, but you only receive eighty, so you're expecting the twenty in nineteen. You do your taxes, you pay on the hundred, and throughout all of nineteen, that person never paid you the twenty. You're going to write it off as a bad debt expense in nineteen. So the two years together, you're going to be okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So then if you they pay you in 20, then what do you do? Then you have to add, then you have to add it back. To it. Income. Yeah, then it's income because you expensed it in 19 20, So I'm, I feel like I'm kind of understanding okay. the differences in cash seems a whole lot easier. And maybe that's because it would be more appropriate for my business. Is, is there a benefit to accrual or does, is it case by case? It's case by case. I think really, um, if you're a, what do you do? I'm a potter, so I'm giving somebody a product. Okay, so do they ever commission you to do anything or whatever? Yeah, and I'll take a deposit and then you know get the balance. So if I paid you a deposit, in December, but you haven't provided me the beautiful piece of artwork yet um, until like March or whatever. How? What are you doing with that deposit? Is it income to you or not? Yeah, I would go ahead and I, I'm I'm basically operating on a cash flow, so okay. I would take it as income, and then the balance would be income later. Yes, yes. So, um, yeah, I mean. It, it's really service businesses really are more affected by whether or not cash and accrual are going to be different if you think about it because you know if you're invoicing them and they're paying late or whatever selling bagels or selling a product they walk in the door you give them the product they give you their money cash accrual is really not going to make a whole bunch of difference on the income side on the expense side it's still good because if 
you're buying the things that you're selling from your vendors and you don't have to pay for 60 days or 30 days or whatever, then you know, on the expense side it could it can make a difference, but on the income side not much. Does that help? No. So no, who said no? <laughs> I'm a service company and I was thinking cash would have been easier for me. It is. Or I will be. For me. <laughs> well, okay. Are, Only if are you using you software? Right Nothing right now. Okay. okay. So, um, yeah, if you're using <coughs> software that you're invoicing your clients or customers, if they'll be invoiced. If they'll be invoiced, then, and they haven't paid you by the end of the year, it will make a difference whether you're cash or approval, right? And it's mostly the government is the client. And they could take so are these guys <laughs> eight to nine months to pay sometimes even longer so what's going to happen then if you're reporting that hundred thousand in 18 and you haven't received it yet you you know if you're accrual you're paying the cap or your tax on it and so you might be better off being cash okay so I was thinking that you're not going to pay that. tax on cash you don't have or cash that you haven't paid out right mm -hmm. so yeah. that's why cash is a bit better maybe when it comes to situations like that. Because if I'm cash, if I haven't got the cash, I don't have to pay the tax on it. Mm -hmm. If I haven't paid the cash, then I don't get the tax benefit either. But Is that really the, I mean, that's a big reason, but is that the only reason between using a cash and accrual based accounting? Or are there other reasons a little more like cost to get sold, inventory? Um, like I said, the big guys have to use accrual. That's just the law. Like I have a manufacturing business, a wholesale business, a distribution business, and a retail business. <coughs> a nurse square foot building. So I do everything, but attracting things across multiple chartered accounts and to expense appropriately. We do cash basis because even though we invoice people, it's a couple hundred bucks here, a couple hundred yeah. we get our yeah. money. But that's one thing we're looking into a little bit more is since we have all this inventory, you know, whether it's raw goods, work in progress, or finished goods, you know, that on the expense side, it probably makes a little bit more sense. To, that, that, that's kind of the question I'm asking. Yeah, so when you are when you have a lot of inventory, um, it doesn't affect your profit and loss, thus doesn't affect your tax return until you actually right. sell it, and then you have cost of goods sold right. or the cost of the stuff that you sold, thus the main cost of goods sold, right? So, um, uh, and, and not to detract it, just, but I was going to ask you off break, but okay. maybe we can continue. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that after. Um, back to the service, because we're service as well. When the 1099 from the client is generated, do they generate that based on when you deliver the work to them or when they pay you? And does that have any bearing on it's us? When they, we, don't, we do it cash. It's when they pay you. That's what the 1099 should be based on. Okay. When they pay so that's an argument to do cash, too, in service, because then it links then up with your tax year when you're getting the money and when they're reporting that they paid you the money, right? Yeah, yes. Regardless of if you did the work six months ago and they were Correct. still unpaid. Right. Okay. So if, if you do the work in 18 mm -hmm. and they don't pay you until 19, your 1099 from them should be 19. Okay. When they when you actually get paid. So that's a better argument for sticking with the cash basis. I think yeah, cash for most folks is simpler. Um, however, just remember if you're using a software like QuickBooks and you're invoicing customers and you're putting in bills before you pay them, you are accrual. They'll give you accrual numbers. So that's why you have to make sure you run your reports for your taxes on cash basis if you're cash basis. So then QuickBooks will just pull what you've actually Exactly, received. exactly. So in this case, remember we had a profit and loss where we have a 49, or let's say 50,000 and 120,000 different. I mean, the difference is uh, 50,000, sorry. No, it's not. It's more than that. 50, yeah. There's my math for you. <laughs> so the 120 minus 50 is 70, right? So 50, or $70,000 difference. So if they're accrual, it's going to be better for them, for their taxes, because they have a bigger loss. If they're cash, well, yeah. It's just. So why the big difference? Well, 
Will a cash balance sheet have an accounts receivable balance? We already talked about that. No, it won't. So here's their cash basis, oops, sorry. Their cash basis balance sheet. <coughs> they have cash, that's it. That's their current asset. No accounts receivable. And their accrual, however, check this out. They had 111,000 of accounts receivable at the end of the year. So, right there's our explanation. They had, on a accrual basis, income of 111,000 that won't show up in the cash basis because they didn't receive it yet, okay? So if we compare the two account receivable <coughs> balances between 16 and 17, because you have to look at the change in the accounts receivable, not just the end of the year. They had receivable balance uh, at the end of 16 of 161 and 111 at 17. So it went down by 50,000. So what will that do? That meant we received 50,000 of our accounts receivable I mean, the, the difference is 50,000 because of the accounts receivable change. Does that make sense? It's kind of complicated. <laughs> um, okay, does it make sense? Kind of, sort of, maybe? I guess the main thing to realize is it can make a huge difference. But what is it making a difference in? If you were using accrual, do you want to pay the taxes the first year versus the second year? Why I'm, why I'm bringing it up is because once you decide, you're stuck right. with that method. So in their case, if in 16 they had decided on the cash method, their 17 loss would be 50,000. Right. If they had decided on a cruel method, their cash would have been, or their loss would have been 120. Huge difference. But, but my, my question is, what would be the advantage to using a cruel and reporting that I made $110,000 and paying taxes on that instead of saying I made $50,000 and then next year paying, saying I made $60,000, I'm still saying I made the same amount of money. So at the end of the day, those two years, if you put them together, if you start a business in 16, end in business in 17, and you know, whatever, right. you put them together, you're gonna be exactly the same, okay. cash or accrual, right? Because all the cash that you had in accounts receivable in 16, Ooh. you received in right. 17. Um, so the, the, the example there wasn't to show you which was more advantageous right. or what you should choose. It was just to show you it can make a huge difference. But in the end, okay. it all balances. But in the end, it balances if you don't continue business because you got to look at, you know, right. 17 goes into 18 and 18 into 19. You're always going to have differences, most likely, in cash versus accrual. And in that case, it was a pretty big difference because they do big contracting jobs for the government and they're paid way after the fact. So with accrual, um, yeah, I mean, with accrual, you can have income that you're paying tax on that you haven't received yet. You haven't received the cash. So it, it's important to know what you are, and if you want some help determining if you haven't already decided, because it's your first year in business, and you want some help determining whether you should be cash or accrual, most likely I'd say go with cash, but um, if your situation's a bit different, we can talk about it. I'll give you guys my cards if you want or whatever, and um, we can evaluate. Because some businesses are better accrual, some are cash, probably. You know, it just depends, really. If you're talking about on the whether they bring in the money and get the product or not. And so anyway, the whole thing about this was once you decide, you're stuck with it. Unless you get a special ruling from the IRS, and I would say that you don't probably want to do that. <laughs> <laughs>
What's a chart of accounts? It's a listing of accounts that a company has identified and made available for reporting transactions in its general ledger. What's a general ledger? We refer to it as the books. Yeah. So if you have a friend call you up and say, hey, let's go fishing tomorrow. You say, oh, I can't, I gotta work on my general ledger. They'd be like, what? Right? But if you say, I can't, I gotta work on my books, they'll get it. So, um, typically in this order. So on the balance sheet, we have assets, liabilities, owner's equity. That's the balance sheet account. Uh, on the income statement, I sometimes say income statement, sometimes profit and loss, it's the same thing. We have operating and non-operating revenues and expenses. So the income statement is typically what we're usually more concerned with because it's whether or not we're making money or not, whether or not we have a profit, whether we have a loss, um, what's really more important to us as a small business is the income statement. But the balance sheet also is important. Why? <laughs> well, because they go, they work together in conjunction. So the balance sheet will show the financial position of a business at a specific point in time. And we talked about it already. What is that specific point in time, the one that's most important? 1231, right. It does not close at the end of the year. What does that mean? The balance sheet, if you have cash at 1231, you're still going to have that cash on 1-1. One, one. So that's what I mean by it doesn't close. Whereas the income statement, okay, so the assets have to, who, who's heard this before? Assets have to equal liabilities and owner's equity on the um, balance sheet. Think of the assets over here, the owner's equity and liabilities over here. This is what you own, the assets. This is what you owe, the liabilities and owner's equity. <laughs> you are rolling your eyes at me going, owner's equity, I don't owe anybody. It's Think of it as what the business owes you as the business owner. Or if you're a partnership, you know, two, three people, whatever. So it's assets what you own, and this is what you owe. Usually liabilities, we consider what we owe, uh, you know, our accounts payable. Income statement shows revenue expense activity for a period of time. So you run your income statement, if you have software, uh, for a day, a week, a month, a quarter, or a year. What's most important for your tax return? Obviously the year, right? It does close at the end of the year, meaning, if you have, um, let's say, rent expense on 1231 of $20,000, what's your rent expense on 1-1? One, one? Zero. Zero. Right. So balance sheet continues on. Your cash, 1231 to 1-1 one, one is the same, unless you spent some money. Um, however, the income statement, it's not. So if you run an income statement on 1-1, one, one, what are you going to show? Now this is if you sat up on New Year's Eve and closed out your books, right? Which we don't do. Well, maybe I don't know. Um, but technically, if you later on, after you close your books and everything, and you run an income statement as of 1-1, one, one, what's it gonna show? Zero. Zero. Your balance sheet, however, continues on. Well, where does the bottom line of the income statement, which is what? Your profit or loss, right? Where does that go if the income statement goes to zero? Retained earnings. Correct. And what is retained earnings? Have or work the work. The business. 
So equity, owner's equity, is, is the, the parts of owner's equity would be like owner contribution, when you put some money into the business to get started, or when the business wasn't doing so well and you had to put in personal funds down the road or whatever, owner contribution. Money that you've taken out of the business are owner distributions. And then you've got your retained earnings, which uh, is your sum of your profits and losses for all the years you've been in business. And the total of those, simplifying it a bit, three items will be your owner's equity, basically what the business owes you as the owner, meaning you've left that in the business, you've taken this out of the business, you put that into the business, if you think about it as your business being like almost like a bank account. You put it, make a deposit into it, you take a withdrawal out of it, and then it's earning interest or having NSF fees, whatever, if you want to think of it as a bank account. Does that make sense? Um, so it closes at the end of the year into retained earnings. And the difference between income and expense is the profit and loss for period, obviously, right? So um, let's determine what type of account these are. Is, is retained yes. earnings, I mean, is that equal to net profit then? Or loss? That's or what loss? I was ask. For year one, yes. Year two would be year one and two together. Year three would be three years together. It's a cumulative because the balance sheet, remember, keeps going. So it could be a negative amount. It can be a negative amount. Like those guys that I showed you that example, they had that loss either of 50 or 120. What was their retained earnings at the start of year two was negative 120 or negative depending on cash or accrual. So yeah, it can be negative. Um, obviously, that's not why we're in business, um, because if it's consistently and always negative, that means we're losing money every year, and um, you can do that for a while, especially starting a business, but if you claim a loss for 30 years on a business, the IRS is probably gonna say, it's not a business. Why, do, why are we in business? To make money, right? To live. So if you're having a loss for 30 years consistently, probably, and I don't know where the, where the cutoff is. They kind of say that if you have losses for 50, or 50, huh? for five years, they may consider it a hobby. <laughs> if they come in and say, that is really not a business, that's just a hobby, you're trying to write off your hobby as a business, and you can't because you're always losing money. They can say that. So you guys have heard that, right? About the hobby definition. So let's determine uh, what type of account these are. If they're on the balance sheet or income statement, inventory. Balance. Balance sheet. And what is it? Asset, liability, or equity? Asset. Asset. Exactly. Taxes payable. The liability on. Balance sheet, right. Cost of goods sold. Income huh? Yep. No one knows it's not an asset. Cost of goods sold is an expense? Yeah. A special kind of expense, though. Uh, interest expense. Obviously, it's on the profit or loss or income statement as an expense. Be careful. If you have a loan, for example, and you're paying $500 a month, that $500 a month is broken up between principal and interest, right? Okay. The principal reduction, say you take a loan for $10,000 and you have to pay back $500 a month. So for that tax year, <coughs> 500 times 12, you're gonna have $6,000 of payments. What part goes on the income statement? What part goes on the balance sheet? Because you wanna make sure that you get it correct because that interest expense is a business expense and you wanna get the credit for it to reduce your taxes, right? We wanna get as many expenses as we can. So of that $6,000 that you've paid, maybe 
thousand of it is interest and expense. It's going to go on the income statement. The other five thousand of it is reducing what you owe the bank. So it's on the balance sheet. So at the end of the year, you borrowed ten, you paid back six, but only five of it was principal reduction. So your ending balance on your loan to the bank, loan payable to the bank is what? No, it's five. It's five. <laughs> no, it's five because you paid back six, but a thousand of its interest. Yeah. So be careful with that because I've seen that happen before where um, the whole six thousand you paid is not expense. You can't claim that because, well, it's just not. You are paying back principal for the five thousand. So the part that's on the balance sheet, what, does that go under assets or liabilities? Um, for which? The, the loan? Yeah. yeah, the loan would be a liability. Okay. Yeah. You got the money to do something with it. You either bought materials, you paid rent, you bought equipment or whatever. So how you use the money will determine where the money actually ends up going. But what you owe the bank is a liability on the balance sheet. So it really could be an expense because I'm paying rent or I'm buying equipment. So then the, the 6000 of the 10 that I used is actually a write-off too. Correct. If you used it for paying bills that are expenses, yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. But also knowing that the vehicle you purchase is also an asset to the company as well, even though it's a liability. Yes. So if you... If you took the 10,000 and bought a vehicle, what would your financial statements show? Right then and there would be nothing on the income statement. It would show 10,000 loan to the bank as a liability and $10,000 vehicle. Your assets and liabilities equal. Because assets have equal liabilities and equity, right? And no expenses. However, if you took that $10,000 and paid rent and paid your salaries and used it for operating the business, then you're gonna have $10,000 liability to the bank. And the other side of it is going to be on the income statement as expenses. So that's why it's so cool that it's always equal credits. Can you explain the distinction between the operating and the non-operating revenues and expenses? Yeah, we'll, we'll get there actually in a second. Okay. Uh, and a, if the company owes IRS Okay, so you make a deal with the IRS, right? And you owe them $5,000. You can record in your books a liability to the IRS, okay? Um, it's kind of like a loan to the, from the bank, really. It's a liability. And then when you are paying it, what would you record? Same thing, you're paying probably, I don't know how it works out, but a reduction in what you owe them would be like a principal payment, and then if there's interest in addition to that. The only thing is you can't deduct interest that you pay to the IRS. Forgot about that part, yeah, yeah. If you pay penalties and interest to the IRS, it's not deductible. They're not gonna give you credit for... You're penalizing. Yes, you're being penalized, not rewarded for <coughs> additional expense. Mm -hmm. Can it be accrual, the amount? Can it be accrual? Right. The interest to the IRS? Not necessarily the interest, but the balance of it, because you're not going to be able to pay it off in one year, so you're going to be on right. so it, whatever the case is. Right, so it's, that one is kind of weird because why do you even owe them? It's because you had taxes that you owed at some point that you didn't, weren't able to pay. Right. So it was a result of your income statement for that period, right? Yeah. So in the next period, when you make a deal with them, you have a liability to them, um, and there is no income and expense at all, nothing associated with it. Because even if you are paying interest, you can't deduct it. So okay. you just have to have it off your books. Well, you can have it on your books, but you can't put it on your tax return. Got it. Um, did I answer your question? So you only run it for the one year. Well, yeah, hopefully you don't owe them every year. And <laughs> Yeah. So tax having the tax bill is a liability. Paying the tax bill 
it's, it's reducing that liability. So it could, okay, so it wouldn't be in any other section, okay. Mm -hmm. No. So it's cash out the door and it's reducing the liability, so it's all a balance sheet issue. Um, depreciation expense. Obviously, it's an expense and it's, um, this is where, yeah, uh, so it's on the profit and loss. Machinery. Asset on the balance sheet, right? Owner draw, this is a good one. What's that? Income. Okay. What is you borrow money from the bank? How do you borrow money from the company? And take money. Expense or take, take money. Or the yeah. owner takes cash. Yeah, the owner's taking cash out of the business. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's not so salary. It's not salary. salary. So what section of the, where is it first of all, in the balance sheet or income statement? Balance sheet. Balance sheet, in what section? Owner's equity section, exactly. So it's not an expense of the business, folks. It's not an expense of the business. Well, well employees and, and salaries are an expense. Correct. Okay. And if you are being treated as a corporation through the S-Corp mechanism, you are required to pay yourself before you take any owner draws and that paying of yourself is a business expense. So that's different than this. This would be, why even do the S-Corp thing? We'll diverge just a second on that. Why do it? How? How is, let's say you um, pay yourself, you have to pay yourself a reasonable salary before you take any distribution. So for your job, if you had to bring someone off the street to do your job, maybe you have to pay them $90,000. I don't know, I'm just guessing. So if you pay yourself $90,000 through payroll, through salary, that's a business expense. But if your business is booming and you can take out of the business, in addition to that $90,000, another $100,000, that $100,000 you do not pay Social Security and Medicare, you don't pay the 15.3% on it. It's called self-employment tax when you take it as a distribution. So your 90,000, you're paying the Social Security and Medicare on. The 100,000 as a distribution, you skip that part. When do they get What's suspicious your... though? Like what if you say, if he I'm taking 100,000 and he's taking 300,000 in distribution. That would be suspicious right there. Yeah, so if or he's, but, taking, but if if he's paying take, himself 10000 But what if it costs $100,000 to hire someone to do his job if he takes them off the street and that hasn't changed? He's just very good at what he does and making a lot of profit. So no, as long as he pays himself uh, the 100000 that's a reasonable salary. Right. He's okay. He can have distributions of $3 million okay. and not pay that tax on it. So it's more determining what the proper salary is. Correct. But so if he pays himself... 10,000 when he'd have to pay someone on the street 100 and takes all the rest as distribution, then that's when he gets But how do you, uh, it seems to me there are nuances in determining salary, maybe this is getting off topic, because I mean, you okay. could be an author and you could be, you know. Is it gray? You could yes. be John Uptake, or is you could be someone who writes grocery store, you know, novels, so. So if you had to hire someone like an author, you think about it as if you had to hire that person off the street, whatever you're doing as the owner, that's what you need to pay yourself to be on the safe side. I have an example of this CPA who had a firm that he took in salary 25,000 and took um, in distributions 175,000. So he got 200,000. He was paying his staff accountants like 50 or 75,000 paying himself less than them. They came in and said, uh-uh, 25,000 is not a reasonable salary. We're gonna reclassify some of those distributions that you call distributions as salary, and then he had to go back and pay the tax and stuff on that. And guess what happened then? If he's doing it, I wonder if he's recommending that to his clients. Started auditing his clients and caught several that way because you know, obviously if he's doing, he thinks it's a good idea and he was getting away with it for a while, I guess, and recommend it to them. So the question I would have is, is there a value? First of all, I think we always underestimate what our value is, okay? So we're always gonna pay ourselves less than what the market would say that we're worth. However, but say we pay ourselves the six figure, okay? 
if I'm going to give myself a owner withdrawal, isn't there value to the company then having less money at the end of the year to be taxed on? No, because no, you pay okay. you pay tax whether you take it out of the business or not. Okay. So in the example where that CPA, for example, um, took 175 in distribution, so his bottom line, let's just say, was 175. Right. He still paid the federal and state tax and on that. What you don't have to pay is the Medicare and Social Security. Okay. okay. Yeah. So okay. it's not all tax that's avoided, just <clears throat> that 15.3% part. Okay. part. You might add, I would assume that in your example of a reclassification that is done by the IRS, in addition to the tax owed, there will be interest oh, and penalties. Sure. Yeah, he is a big trouble. Uh, so, it can yeah. end up costing him a lot, yeah. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then unemployment gets involved, and workers' comp gets involved, and yeah, it can be very scary. You said that was for an S-corp. Uh, no. The S Corp, you have the requirement of paying yourself okay. before you but take the distribution. LLC, you do not. LLC, you can pay yourself a uh, salary or you can take distributions. Either way, you're paying the self, either you're paying it through the uh, mechanism <coughs> of the payroll function. So you're taking it out of your paycheck. Which means I'm paying Social Security in? Yes. Or you're paying it as self employment income whatever's left over. Okay. If Even if you take it or you don't take it, the bottom line is that's self-employment income and you pay the full amount. You pay the social security taxes and stuff at the end anyway, so. Yeah. So that's why people like to be escorts or treated as escorts, okay? That's kind of off the subject, but. What about sole proprietors? Huh? What about sole proprietors? Yeah, so it depends. Yeah, sole proprietor is you're paying tax on your bottom line profit. If you pay yourself a salary, you're paying tax through that mechanism, but you're also paying the bottom line, whatever's left over too. So you, you don't avoid the self-employment tax when you're a sole proprietor. The only time you avoid the self-employment tax for a pass-through entity is being treated as a corporation through the S Corp mechanism. It doesn't make sense to do an S Corp for yourself until you're at a point where you're making, you know, I don't know where the, the dividing line is, but you, I don't know, I'd say $75,000 or something, you know, that you're taking as distributions, then maybe it makes sense to be treated as an S Corp so you can avoid that 15%. Because it costs more to be an S Corp, right? So I'm just getting started with um, real estate investing, I just had expenses. I also um, rent out, uh, uh, I stay resident in my house, but I'll have a renter or a traveling nurse. So the income from there, at this point, I don't have an LLC for either. Mm -hmm. Can I just merge all that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Accounts receivable, it's on the balance sheet, it's an asset, right? Loss on sale of assets, what is this? This is a good example of a non-operating expense. So what this means is you bought an asset for 50,000, you depreciated it down to 20,000, and then you sold it for only 10,000, you have a $10,000 loss. That would be in the non-operating uh, expense section of the income statement because you don't, you're not in the business of selling your assets. Does that help explain non-operating? Mm -hmm. So non-operating would be anything that you're either paying or receiving um, that you typically wouldn't pay or receive in your type of business. Like if you got a grant, for example, like if I got a grant, well, I don't typically, accounts don't get grants, but if I happen to get one for whatever reason, maybe SBDC would give me one. Um, it would be in my non-operating. Doesn't really matter though, I'm still gonna pay tax. Mm -hmm. Credit card payable obviously is a liability 
and it's on the balance sheet sales revenues, obviously is income, and on the income statement. And, oh, there's the answers. Ah. What is double entry bookkeeping? Every transaction must debit at least one account and credit at least one account, and debits must, must, must always equal credits. What is a debit? What if it's um, related on the uh, balance sheet? I, I want to increase my cash on my balance sheet. Am I going to debit or credit it? No, I'm going to debit it. So you can't say debit's expense. Debit simply means left side. We're going to get there. Yeah. What is a credit? Right side. Exactly. You're brilliant. That's all it is. It's a way to keep books. And it doesn't mean good. It doesn't mean bad. They're just, they just are. So outflow, inflow. Not necessarily. It's left and right. Okay. And they have to equal. And they have to equal. So think of it just as debits are, this is my right here, left, I guess. Um, debits are here, credits are here. Just think of it like that. Left and right of what? <laughs> right? Because I'm just talking mumbo jumbo right now. Let's illustrate by using T accounts to post a journal entry, like in the olden days. So you guys who are using Excel, if you're doing double entry bookkeeping on your Excel spreadsheet, you're going to have, you're gonna be kind of like this guy, and um, you're gonna have to debit and credit something. The software knows what to debit and credit. Now when I say if you're doing double entry bookkeeping using Excel, that's the key word there. You don't necessarily have to, um, but anyway. So we're going to record a deposit of a $50 check from a customer, okay? So we have to debit something and credit something. So by T accounts, I mean just that. It's like this. Uh, these are debits, these are credits, left and right. So bank account or cash and then we have sales income because we're getting fifty dollars from a customer right so we have income on the income statement and cash or the bank account on the balance sheet we're gonna debit bank account fifty dollars what are we gonna what are we gonna do to sales income we have to credit that's all it is if you're using software and you tell it that you're making a deposit and it asks you, oh, what are you depositing? And you tell it, oh, I'm depositing this receipt for this invoice that I sent this customer. It knows what to do behind the scenes. But I think it's really cool if you guys know what behind the scenes it's doing. Maybe because I'm a geek, I don't know. Um, so accounting software automatically does this for us behind the scenes. But it's important for you to have a general understanding to help identify errors. So for example, if you have a credit balance in your accounts receivable account, what does that mean? You have an energy. Think about it. If you do have a liability of owing money to your customer, so typically, a credit balance in accounts receivable, if you saw that, you would go, that doesn't make any sense. That says that I'm owing my customers this money when they, in fact, owe me. So to know what's supposed to be typically a debit balance and typically a credit balance is a good thing to know. So that if you, if you see a credit balance in your inventory, what does that mean, Hans? Again. How could that happen Sorry, if you have a credit balance in your inventory? Because you have inventory, right? right? So if you have material that you use to make a good, but it's basically it's sitting in inventory? Is that what you're talking about? No, a credit balance in inventory basically means you have negative inventory. How is that possible? Well, if you saw that on your balance sheet, you would go, that's not possible. You made it. I made a mistake. Yeah. Exactly. What could the mistake have been? 
Maybe the mistake was when you got the inventory in from the vendor, you didn't record it. But you have it physically in your warehouse and you're selling it and it's going into cost of goods sold and reducing your inventory on your books, but you never put it in inventory. Aha, I forgot to put my purchase of inventory in inventory. <clears throat> so I think it's good to know those things so that you can find errors because guess what, where human errors happen, what if we debit something, we're supposed to credit it or whatever, you know? And we're getting a little complicated with tone of equity. So if the total's wrong, is the whole thing wrong? <laughs> Maybe not, probably not. It's probably an error somewhere, but not the whole thing, I mean, no way. Um, credit balance accounts receivable. Okay, so credit balance accounts receivable <coughs> means you owe your customers. Is that possible? You say no. Well, how'd that happen? Same thing as inventory. Maybe you received some money from a customer and you received it as a deposit which would have credited your accounts receivable, but maybe somehow, some way, the invoice that you sent them never got recorded. You know, so you have it reducing your accounts receivable, but it never was in accounts receivable to begin with, just like the inventory. So the accounts that are typically with a debit balance, and I think this is important to know, are these, the assets, the cash, the inventory, accounts receivable, equipment and also expenses are typically a debit balance. Accounts that typically have a credit balance are the liabilities, accounts receivable, you know, anything that you owe. Also, this customer deposit. Why, some of you folks, we talked about it um, individually, take customer deposits, right? You do. So why is that a liability? You got the cash in, why is it a liability? You owe them so a yes. product. Yes. It's because if you don't fulfill your obligations, you have a debt to them. That's why. And then also, income is typically a, a credit balance. So when you have a net loss at the bottom of your income statement, is that a debit or a credit? balance if we want to look at what we're going to have to do to retain the earnings to get it into, you know, close the income statement, put it into the balance sheet. Is it, if it's a loss? That's all. Debit. Who said debit? <coughs> Ooh. It's a debit. Basically, your expenses were more than your income. You have a loss, right? So, more trickier your accounts. Okay. We'll create a debit balance or create a, a credit balance in equity. So owner contributions is a credit balance. Uh, retained earnings, if the profits are greater than the loss. Corporation, if we have stock um, or our current net income. Those are all credit balances. Those are good things on our equity section of our balance sheet. Debit balances typically will be, remember we said the three things that, that you know, affect equity, contributions, distributions, and then retained earnings. So distributions or draws are going to have a debit balance. Retained earnings if your losses are greater than your profits. Corporations if you're paying dividends or if you have a current net loss. So that's good. Credit balance, not so good. Debit balance, in equity that is. Okay. So assets. We like to see debit balances. That means we own something. We have some cash, we have some equipment, we have some inventory. We want those to be debit balances. However, equity, we want to be credit balances. That means we actually have something in the business because we have profits over losses. Uh, we have net income, we have contributions, okay? So, um, and this was all to kind of go, to give you a general idea. If you look at your balance sheet and your equity is a credit balance, is that good or bad? Or your assets are a credit balance, is that good or bad? Okay, so have I confused everybody really? 
Who's not confused? <laughs> oh, good Lord. <laughs> so, for example, she has a sewing machine company. So, the credit, her liability is that she has bought 10 sewing machines. Why is that a liability? Well, it's because she hasn't paid them, okay. paid for them yet. So, she owes a vendor. She owes a vendor. Uh -huh. And so, it's a liability, but it's also an asset. Correct. So, there's a, there's a debit. Correct. To pay that, say, ten thousand dollars for the ten sewing machines. Yeah. Overpriced a little bit. Right? <laughs> Maybe but then, so I get those kinds of pieces. But then, how does equity play into that? I, equity account sounds like something different. So, so like so, Schwab or something. Schwab. 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 Um, <laughs> or like equity account. There's, there's no whiteboard here, right? Yeah. 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 It's behind the board. That looks like it's for help. You open it. Watch me not just that. So, we start a business. Oof. Yeah, that's the problem. You can't see it. No. I can go grab you one. Oh, that's Maybe that's just okay. open up the other side. Oh, we can do this side. Yeah. And close to the other side. And I'll stay back here. <laughs> um, Okay, so in that example, you start a business, you somehow um, did you, so you didn't, you didn't have the $10,000 to buy the sewing machines, right? So if you borrowed to, bar, to buy the sewing machines, then you would have asset of machines, right? Sorry guys that uh, can't see this. And then you have a liability of the debt, debt which could be a loan, it could be yeah. just owe the vendor, whatever. Let's just say it's accounts payable, okay? That you owe them $10,000. There is nothing that has affected equity yet. You just have two items on the balance sheet and um, nothing on the income statement. So you start working, right? And you have, you start making money. So that's gonna be on the income statement. Let's say that um, you make income of, let's just keep it simple and say 5K for whatever period, it doesn't really matter. And do you have any expenses? Yeah, 2,000. 2,000 of expenses. A year. We're doing a year. What, to pay these guys back. Oh. Or no. The bank. What was the yes, 2,000 for? Yes, the interest will, will be an expense. Yes. Um, but, and then my other expense would be housing the machines. Housing the machines. Is it cash out or is it renting, rent? Let's say renting, rent. Renting, renting, yeah. Okay, so we have rent then of an expense yeah. of 2,000. Okay, so bottom line, we have a profit of three, right? Let's just say this is our year's over, we're doing it for a month or something. We have a 3K profit, okay? What happens with that? So now we need to categorize where all those monies go that you wrote down below, asset and liability. I feel like that's what the aim is here. No, the aim is um, to because you were, you were saying that equity it didn't make much sense when it came to. Yeah, so like I kind of want to figure out the balance sheets <coughs> to me that the bookkeeping. Okay, yeah. And so where would I put those? And then put once what? I put, so the, the um, income was 5K, so that became a credit in my opinion. <coughs> yes. Saying, yeah. yeah, so under liabilities, I'd put plus 5,000. Why? Well, because it's on the right side, so there's credit. I yeah, but see, the income statement doesn't close into the balance sheet until, let's just say, the end of the day or the end of the year. So what's going to close into the balance sheet over here? You've got assets over here. You've got liabilities and equity. Is only the 3000 That's going to go up to retained earnings. Sorry, my um, handwriting's horrible. 
but retained earnings is going to be three thousand. Okay. Okay. So balance or income statement at the end of the year now is zero. We've ran a new income statement. I shouldn't say end of the year. Beginning of the next year should be zero. The three thousand profit is now up in your equity section of your balance sheet. But why is that a liability? I don't. It's not a liability. It's owner's equity. Does it say liability? Okay, so I'll do another little thing here. Owner's equity. <laughs> so it's on this side. Oh, okay. Yeah. But aren't we at a balance? Yes. Yes. Uh huh. So how do we balance? So you have to put three thousand on the left side, but it's a debit because you took the money out and bought groceries. Is that, I mean, you paid yourself. So is that the debit? Yeah, that would be fine because you had a three thousand of profit. Yeah. You had to buy groceries, so it <clears throat> technically isn't over on this side, but it is a debit. You're right, and it's called draw. Owner draw, which would close into this retained earnings in your equity section. So your retained earnings was three, your draw is three, you're back to zero for equity, and you're 10 and 10. So. And, is, and the draw of 3K is an asset because it's something I got to use and. and Not an asset. Not for the business. So right. even though it's on the left, it doesn't mean it's always says asset or debit on the right. Oh. Correct. Correct. And is that? Left does not mean asset. Okay. Left means left. Left means left. Okay. If you want to take a draw, you're right. You're right on track. It's debit. It has nothing to do with assets. Okay. What happens if you didn't take a draw? If, if you didn't take a draw, how would you balance it then? Then your, your retained earnings is up here is three. Where is that 3,000? In the bank. So we're 13 and 13. We're in balance. Yay. Yep. And that's how the income statement and balance sheet intermingle. If you think about it, I mean, this had to go somewhere. Either with a loaner draw, it's in the bank still. There are some other options, I don't know, it doesn't matter, but it's somewhere. Really a recording of how it's moving. Is that a good way to think about it? Mm -hmm. Yep. Because it was retained earnings, but then you put it in the bank, so then you recorded it over here. Yep. And it's still retained earnings. Right. It's a credit in retained earnings, a debit in bank, our debits and credits equal, we're good. Now this is after we close the income statement, because before we close the income statement, it's still down here. However, the software knows that your balance sheet has to balance. So there'll be an equity account calling, called current earnings or loss, and there'll be a debit or credit so that your balance sheet stays in balance, even before you close. Make sense? Can you please define equity account? Equity is what you have in the business or don't have in the business, basically. If you think about it. Equity, your, your comp? How much your business is worth? Uh, kind of, sort of, to you. What your business is worth, you know, your business could be worth a ton because you've got a copyright or you've got a, you know, whatever. Um, but book value of it, yeah. So book value and market value, totally unrelated, right? Because, for example, no one's going to buy my business if I have a book value, but it's not worth anything to anybody else, um, just to me. Mm -hmm. So I do have a book value, and it's not necessarily a market value. But, um, so, equity is what you put into it. Minus what you take out. What is equity? Oh, oh, minus. Equity. Yeah, because you asked me about equity, right? Yeah. Yeah, so equity is what your owner contributions minus your owner draws, plus your net income, minus your net loss. It's the catch-all kind of, if you want to think about it that way, for your income statement, because it will close into the equity. So your assets, again, are what you own. You own machinery. You own cash. You own accounts receivable. 
Um, you own inventory. Kind of, sort of, I should say own, because you could maybe owe more, like in this case. If you didn't pay these guys your 10,000, they'll come and take your machines though, then you'll be back at zero, right? You won't owe them, but you also won't have machines. So assets are what you own, liabilities and equity are what you either owe a third party or owe yourself as the business owner, okay? So think about uh, if you leave the money in the business, you don't take it as a distribution, where is that money? Retained. It's in retained earnings in the equity section as a credit. Do you pay tax on it? Yes. Yes. So unfortunately, we can't say, I'm leaving it in the business, so I don't need to pay tax on it. Because we as small business people, we and the business are one and the same, right? They're called pass-through entities. Everything passes through the business to us and goes on our tax return. Now, it doesn't have to be one person. It can be 10 or 20 or 100. They would be partners then, right? So partners, let's say you have two partners and there's a net profit of 50,000. Each one of those is gonna report on their income tax return 25,000 of income or loss, the same thing. They'll each report $25,000 loss on their tax return through Schedule C or through Schedule E. So that's getting into the nitty gritty, but. So I don't know if I'm understanding that retained earnings, so if it's cumulative and you pay taxes on retained earnings and you pay taxes on 5,000 last year and then it stayed in your retained earnings, are you double paying? No, no. Once you pay tax on it, you don't pay tax on that portion again. Because when you report your activity to the IRS to figure out what you need to pay tax on, you report the income statement. This part of it. This is really ugly. <laughs> um, so, you know, your income minus your expenses, if you have a profit, you're going to pay tax on it. If you have a loss, you're not, because there's nothing to pay tax on. You had a loss. The loss can be carried forward, et cetera, et cetera, too, but that's a good one for a tax class. And not to throw a monkey in the wrench, but what's the difference between passive income and non-passive? Passive income is if you are interest income, for example. You're doing nothing physically. You're not getting calluses on your hands for that interest. That's passive income. And then how do I report that? Doesn't it just always roll over until I sell the asset? Or the income that I make? So passive, um, there's passive and non-passive. So non-passive would be you're physically doing something, getting calluses on your hands to make that money, right? Or you okay. know, using your brain power to make that money. Passive, capital gains is passive. So but if you, you pay own, it when you sell it. Huh? But you pay it when you sell yeah, the stock. Yeah. Or, and, the, and yeah, that's the difference between passive and non-passive. And capital gains are taxed at a different rate than earned income, et cetera. Or rental income <coughs> is passive. Rental income, that's a different one. Okay. Who has rentals? Yeah, several of us. So you can actively participate in the renting of your property even though you're not getting calluses. And that's what you want to do because your tax advantages are better because you're actively participating. If you, anyone use TurboTax and go through the questions? When you go through the questions, it'll ask you, and you have a rental property, it'll ask you how many hours or whatever. It'll ask you if you're a real estate professional. So, yeah. And anyway, that better, gets into the passive, non-passive. Yeah. And you think it's better to have it as non-passive for rental income if you're... I didn't say that. Oh, <laughs> it's hard to know. You have yeah. to evaluate it. Okay. Yeah, you want to have, you want to offset your earned income by your rental loss if you have a loss, for example. So you want that, yeah, that's getting really, 
Okay. Taxi complicated. <laughs> but um, yes. Um, so if you take distributions as a business owner, yes. How do you record that on your income tax? Do you have to generate some form for yourself from your business to because it's income, right? And it has to be reported or not? Okay, so that's a really good question. Did everyone catch that? No. Um, if you take a distribution from your business, how does your business report that to you? Right? Well, yeah, I mean... And I, because it's income, you're going to pay tax on it. Right, I mean, how, how do you account for that with the IRS? <laughs> how you account for it depends on whether or not you're a sole proprietor or a partnership or a corporation, but it's just... An S-Corp. Yeah. The S-Corp will function much like one of those other two. The IRS recognizes sole proprietorships, partnerships, and corporations. That's all they recognize. They don't even recognize LLC. LLC can be any of these. Mm -hmm. Well, it can't be a corporation, but. Um, so anyway, depends on if you're a partnership or a uh, sole proprietor. I'm an LLC, I'm a single member LLC, so I'm, in the eyes of the IRS, a sole proprietor. It gets reported. Whether it's distributed to me or not, doesn't matter. It gets reported on my Schedule C as a profit or a loss. Whether I took it out of the business bank account or not. So the Schedule C is the business's tax return? It's or a the person? schedule on your 1040 oh. that's labeled business profit and loss. Okay. If your partnership is different, your partnership the bottom line of the business profit or loss gets divided amongst the partners, right? On a different tax return. A partnership has to do a separate tax return as does an S Corp. Has to do a separate tax return in addition to your 1040. Okay? And what goes to the partners? Schedule C. No. K1. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> A K-1 will go to the partners, the partners put it on their 1040 through Schedule E, and that's how a partnership would be reported. Distributions on a partnership are reported, but just reported. They're not necessarily taxed, because you're taxed on the bottom line, remember, whether it's distributed or not. But, but as an individual, so if I'm receiving it, so if my husband has the business and he gives himself so much salary, and he's doing better, and those retainer earnings or the profit at the end, he moves over to our account uh -huh. as individuals mm -hmm. for income for our family. Mm -hmm. Then what is our obligation? I mean, we have to report that as income, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then how would you account for that? Does okay, so if he's an employee of his own business, yeah, he's a consultant. he gets a W-2? Yes. Okay, so W-2 gets reported up in the W-2 line, and the everything else, and, and the what he pays himself is an expense on your Schedule C. Right. And then the bottom line of the Schedule C, profit or loss, you either pay or don't pay. You know, if you, it's a profit, you pay your self-employment tax on it, whether you distributed it or not. Okay. Okay. So if you make a million five and take out 500,000, because that's all you need to live on, and leave the million in the company, how much are you taxed on it? Yes, a million five. So the distribution doesn't matter really uh, as far as taxes go. You're still paying on the million five. So I, I guess I was thinking of it, and maybe I'm mistaken, is that you have your individual taxes yes. and then you have the business. It depends taxes. on what type of business. So I'm kind of confused. Okay, now, if you're sole proprietor yeah. or a single member LLC, there's no separate tax return, there's just a separate schedule, Schedule C. If you have 10 businesses, you'll have 10 Schedule Cs. Okay, okay as part of the 1040. If it's a partnership or an S Corp, being taxed as an S Corp, you have a separate tax return, and then how does it get onto your tax return through the K1? And it doesn't matter if there's only one of you or a hundred of you. There'll be one K1 or hundred K1s and it's gonna go on those 1040s. Make sense? So would 
what determines what tax bracket you're in? Like, you pay yourself, could you bump yourself into another tax bracket, or if you leave it in your company and you didn't make any money? If you leave it in your company or not, it doesn't, uh, if, if you have a profit, if you leave it in the company, you don't take it, you're still paying tax on it, so you're in that tax bracket as if that was income. Because it was, technically. Unless you invested in something for the business, like, okay, well, we're gonna go buy a new machine for, right? Yeah, I mean, just sort of. But then you've got an asset, you buy a machine, it doesn't affect the profit or loss statement or income statement unless you can depreciate the whole thing in the same year. So in the past, that would have only benefited us one-fifth or 20% for that year, right? But now with the changes in the depreciation rules, if we're able to depreciate it, which is an expense, it's gonna lower. So if we have a profit of 50 and we go and buy a automobile for the business, that's getting into a whole nother ball of wax. <laughs> but we buy a piece of machinery that you know we'd only use for the business, let's say that instead of an auto, uh, for $50,000. And we're able to depreciate it all in this year, we have a net zero. Regard if we have a 50 profit, we go buy, but you gotta be, the timing is important, right? How many of you know what your profit is before December 31 to go spend it? Probably not, a lot of us, because we get behind in our bookkeeping. <laughs> <laughs> so what determines your first year of business? If you've applied and got your S-Corp, does that mean that is your first year of business, like if it's this year, or is it when you actually start? It's when you make money. Make money. No, I shouldn't say that. It's either when you make money or have expenses that you're gonna report. You don't have to be an entity to have a business. So if we bought cattle and bought our horse trainer and the cattle trainer, all that this year, then that means our business started this year. Yeah, I would say so. And you have some expenses that'll probably put you in a loss if you didn't have income to offset it. And it's very typical to have a loss the first year, whatever, two years maybe, I don't know, but depends on the business. So, um, you know, unless you have to consider those things assets and then there is no expense and, you know, Accounting is, yeah. I hope you guys aren't royally confused. <laughs> when you make the big box. Oh, yeah, I wish. So what's depreciation? We all know that, right? A method to expense fixed assets over the useful life. And this is radically changing. Um, and the problem right now is that there's a lot of things in this tax reform that was passed so quickly that even now, as we're getting towards the end of 18, have not been figured out yet. So going to be really interesting and I think I may stop doing taxes altogether. <laughs> Seriously, it's getting so messed up and complicated. Um, so the assets recorded on the books at their cost, expense allocated over useful life, and that's about it. Um, age old question, my income statement shows a net profit, why don't I have money in the bank? <laughs> or vice versa. I have money in the bank but I'm showing a loss, you know? So what's caused, what could cause this situation? I have a profit, but no money. Expenses exceed the profit. Someone hasn't paid the income taxes? No. Your liabilities? It could be, yes, it could be that. Well, let's take the example of our $50,000 profit that we went and bought a vehicle with. So we have no money in the bank, but we have a profit. And in the days of depreciation, we would have had to depreciate that 50,000 vehicle over five years. So that's how we can have a profit, but no money in the bank. We spent the money, it was cash out the door. So you're getting you know, the cash accrual deal going on there with assets like that, that you have to depreciate is kind of sort of an accrual sort of thing, but it's cash out the door too. So, or, your example of accounts payable. If you had um, accounts payable, meaning you had recorded expenses but had not paid them yet, 
You could have cash in the bank still, but you could have a loss because the expenses have been recorded. So it's getting, it, it's, the bank will always be on cash basis, right? If your books are on accrual basis, you could easily have a profit or a loss and it doesn't agree with the bank. You would think, okay, if I have a profit, I have money in the bank. If I have a loss, my bank account's <laughs> negative or something, I don't know. Um, so your bank is always gonna be cash. If your books are on accrual, you could easily have a profit or a loss that doesn't match the bank. That's, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people will, you know, kind of focus on the bank account because, well, cash is king, pretty important, right? And if everything's going through the bank account, um, we've got everything recorded, but we could still have a profit or a loss that doesn't agree with what the bank is showing, okay? IRS scrutiny, um, and the tax reform is changing a lot of these things. Home office expense, for example, if you are an employee of someone and you have claimed unreimbursed employee expenses for mileage or for home office or for anything else, it's going away. If you are claiming a home office as a business, however, that's staying. So there's a couple different methodologies for doing the home office. One is actual expenses where you take square footage times the, you know, divide by the square footage of your whole house. And, or you can do a simplified method, $5 per square foot up to 300 square feet to get a max of $1,500. But has to be used exclusively and regularly in your business. It can't be the kitchen table. It cannot be the kitchen table, unfortunately unless that's all you do at the kitchen table. But if you eat at the kitchen table, eh, forget about it. But isn't that kind of a negative? Because then when you sell your house, it's appreciated, right? Yes. So it bites you in the butt. Yes. Think about it, If you, unless you use the simplified method. You use the simplified method, you don't have to do that. So she said you can get bit in the butt by doing the home office because when you sell your house, you have to recapture that depreciation just like a rental property or a business asset or whatever. Because it is a business expense, it's considered part business, part personal. So when you sell it, you're right, you're exactly right. Have you been caught with that? Yep, well I didn't do that, that's why. Okay. Home office can be uh, a great benefit, but it can also be a pain because when you, Part of your home office expense, you have to depreciate part of your home as a business asset. So business assets get depreciated. Machinery, vehicles, whatever it is that we use in our business gets depreciated, and it's a business expense. The home office, the part of your home that you classify as home office, who's using it? Me? What? Oh. <laughs> um, the part that you claim as your home office is a business asset and you depreciate it, it benefits you at the time, but when you sell your home, you gotta pay that. It can be very complicated when you sell your home if you've been doing a home office. Anyone do home office? Okay. You might want to evaluate whether or not it's worth the headache of it because sometimes, um, or if you do the simplified method, it's $5 a square foot, you figure out how many square feet are used exclusively and regularly for business, then you don't have to mess around with the whole depreciation, recapture, and all that stuff. Because then it's not depreciating, it's just a deduction. It's just a deduction, yeah. So they did that just because it was so complicated the other way. Yeah. Business mileage, um, again, if you're an employee of someone and you have been used to claiming business mileage because your employer did not reimburse you but you drove for the business and you've been claiming that on your Schedule A, your itemized deductions, that's going away, but for a business, you can still claim it as a business expense if you're not an employee of someone else. So if I leave my home office and drive to an appointment and then drive back, is that a business expense mm -hmm. both ways, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, round trip. If you have an office, however, your drive from your home to your office is not a business expense. <coughs> 
drive from home to a client or office to client in back, yes, it is. But you can't deduct uh, commuting. So if you've got rental property and you drive from point A to point B, is that still a deduction? Mm -hmm. Round trip for next year, for any year in the future, mm -hmm. unless Congress changes it. Mm -hmm. Yep. What if you're driving around just looking at potential rental properties? Yeah. You could claim it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, meals and entertainment. <clears throat> um, this is under big scrutiny, obviously, because it's a high abuse area. And remember that you're only allowed to deduct 50% of it um, because I guess they know it's a high abuse area. And plus, you've got to eat anyway, typically. <laughs> so if, okay, if you have employees and you're having an office party for Christmas, it's all deductible it's a business expense having your employees have good morale and all that kind of stuff if you take a client however to dinner it's 50 percent using the mileage as an example we're going from point a to point b point c to point d do we eat in between is it deductible or not um as a business expense yes. the eating uh You're just you're by yourself? Place, but you're by yourself, but you're going from yeah. place to place to place. Yeah. You could? Yeah, especially if it's far enough from home. I mean, if it's around the block, probably not. But mm -hmm. if it's like you're traveling western Colorado or something like that, right. yeah, you could claim it, what, 50% of it? Is it like a travel meal is what right. that would be. Yeah. So if I'm going to a real estate investing meetup group, that there's no cost for it, but they encourage you to get a cup of coffee or something. I deduct it. Yeah. 50% of it, yeah. Yeah, I do know about 50%. And does QuickBooks do that for you? So I have self-employed QuickBooks. So when I shows my profit loss statement, because it just pulls it up, it's free. It'll show the full, I mean, if you spent $10, it'll show $10. Okay. You're gonna have to know on your tax return, you claim five. Oh, I see. How would you determine how much? You could look at the books and just take half of it. You know what I mean? You would want to have different accounts in your books. Like if you have employees and have a Christmas party, you don't want that lumped in with your meals where you're taking clients out where it's 50%. You want to keep your 50% and your 100% separate so that at the end of the year, you don't have to look at every single thing that went in there and figure it out. You're just wanting to figure it out at the time and then say, okay, this is all 100% fine. This, I'm only gonna take 50%. Figure it out and record it separately, differently in your book, whether it's a travel meal or a entertainment meal where you're taking a client or a Christmas party, using that as an example. If I go to Atlanta for a two-day seminar mm -hmm. and buy breakfast, lunch, and dinner yep. during the seminar, yep. is that 50%? Uh -huh. okay. Because if you were home, You'd have to eat, and you would be able to deduct it. Okay. Uh, okay. There's my information, um, my email, and phone number. Feel free to contact me with any questions. This was a good group, but I feel like we like. I hope I didn't confuse you too much. So hopefully, you got something out of it. Yes. Everybody get something a little bit out of it. Um, it, the, the whole tax thing, like I said, is